The following journal entries were discovered in the home of Dr. Alexander Perditus. The police officers who originally discovered it in his house after making entry were not able to decipher its contents to determine if it was the ravings of a madman or a cleverly hidden cipher. Unable to determine its purpose, it was turned over to the state officials in the hope that they could discover its meaning. Here is the diary in its original form. June 7th, 1936. Today has been a most fortuitous occasion. Yes, you may even say that it has been the greatest day in my professional life. But I am getting ahead of myself. Let me start at the beginning. I was sitting in my office at Harvard, going over student paperwork and musing about the rumblings of war over in Europe, when my good friend and fellow professor, Jack Hamilton, came into my office. He looked excited, but in a state of dishelming, and so pale of skin that I hardly recognized him at first. I proceeded to ask what was wrong, and he said nothing, only handed me a wooden box that he'd stuffed under his coat. I opened it to find a book wrapped in what I presumed to be leather or some other type of animal hide, with the strangest markings on its cover. I am, as you already know, dear journal, a professor in ancient history and languages, but even I, using all my considerable skill, could not decipher its meaning upon first glance. Jack, who had by now sat down, told me that he had discovered this book on a recent trip to Egypt, but that it supposedly came from the Sumerian region of Iraq. I was immediately intrigued and asked him if he could elaborate on its origins, but all he could state to me was what he had already told me. I thanked him very much for the gift and had Jake follow me home so he could get some much needed rest, and my wife, who is a nurse, could properly tend to whatever was causing such great discomfort in my friend. June 8th, 1936 a part of me wonders if Jack was on a bash and the merchant who sold this to him was just having a gas. I've been studying this for hours in my study at home, using every reference material in my library, and a few I borrowed from the university to try and make heads or tails of this. The uh, writing style is chaotic, more like that of someone who's suffering from some form of mental illness than a dedicated scholar. The ink itself has been smeared in places and appears to be written in gold, which is preposterous. The most I've been able to make out is a single phrase, In the abyss does the plague await. In the abyss does your fate awake. After pouring through texts, the only mention I have of him is the Sumerian god Nerga, the god of plague most heavily mentioned during the reign of Hittite king Supaluliyama, when a great plague broke out. Oh yes, I must mention Jake. His sickness appears to have gotten worse. He now spends all day in bed, sweating profusely and mumbling about a great desert and a black wave. I can only hope he gets better and pray for his quick recovery. June 16th, 1936 This confounded book is driving me mad. Every attempt I make is foiled by a later discovery. It's almost as if the Gordian knot was put into book form. I have so far deciphered three more phrases of this damned document, but I am only in the beginning stages of understanding this manuscript. Every phrase is again some mention of catastrophe and plague, but its language is not that of someone afraid of the appending doom. Rather, it seems as though this person is giddy with the idea of the coming pestilence. I can only surmise that this was written by a worshipper of the plague god. For example, such phrases as, Let me be bathed in your beautiful horrors, let me shower in your misery, do indicate a love of this deity. Though I must wonder who in their right mind would worship such a thing. Jake has not been recovering either. My dear friend has unfortunately started to grow wounds on his skin and boils that fester with pus. Whenever my dear wife attempts to clean these out, he reacts violently. He calls them treasures and signs of favor. I can only surmise that his sickness has broken his mind and can only have taken him from my care to be placed into the care of a hospital. 
I hope he recovers quickly, and I will endeavour to decipher this book that my friend has brought me in such obvious cost to himself. June 20th, 1936 I must apologise for my inconsistency in writing. I've been feeling a bit under the weather lately. Nothing serious, just a cough and a general feeling of weariness. But enough about me. I have had a breakthrough moment in the deciphering. I called upon another friend to help, and he informed me that the characters seemed to be a mix of both Sumerian and Egyptian. Why did I not catch it sooner? I must be too weary and worried about my friend to have noticed. Oh, it's so simple to me now. I can feel it. This work will be the greatest in my lifetime. I know of no other document that can hope to be this mysterious and gives a peek into a culture we thought lost to the sands of time. I feel energized and must endeavor to finish this quickly. And, uh, yes, um, an update on Jake. He is at the hospital now, but the doctors are unable to help him, and he is now being placed in solitary after he attacked a nurse and screamed that he must spread the love of Nergal. I find myself disturbed by this, but it must be his mind, right? I mean, he must have gotten an understanding of at least one phrase and... In his fervid state, his mind grasped onto that. As that's the only thing I could see that would cause such a break in my friend's sanity. July 5th, 1936. I feel so illuminated. My mind is racing with the possibilities and the fame I shall attain. Yes, it is true that I am now confined to my bed, unable to get up due to the sickness now racking me. I've had all my research material moved into here and am now dictating this to my niece. But I have discovered so much. This book is not just the ramblings of a lunatic, but rather a path. A guidebook, if you will, to open the door to Nergal, so he may gain entry to this world. It speaks of how he only wishes to show us his love through our suffering, and that suffering brings us closer to him. His plagues are not meant to be feared, but to be embraced as his tender mercies. But surely nobody would believe this. Well, I digress. I will publish my findings as soon as I am healthy. July 15th, 1936. Jake has passed away. My wife told me when she returned from the hospital. He was discovered by a nurse on her regular checks. He was blackened, burst open upon touch, spreading pus and, most curiously, maggots everywhere. My wife is very distressed by all this, and now there are reports of sickness in the hospital. I do not see why she is distressed, for this is obviously the work of the great Nergal. He is saddened that we have grown so far from him, and wishes to bring us closer so we may understand him. I have finally come to understand the truth. The sickness is not to be feared, but to be lauded, to be glorified, to be put up as an object of our worship. Nagal is to be our spiritual guide to the higher planes of understanding. I must figure out a way to spread his message to all. July 18th, 1936. I am now writing this with trembling hands. My niece was afraid to come back due to what she said was my madness. But what madness is there in knowing the truth? I know now how to summon the great Nergal into our realm. I must find those clean of his touch and sacrifice them to him by feeding them his children. My wife left today and said she would not be coming back tonight as the sickness has consumed much of the staff and patients. She'll be staying to help them recover. How could she betray me? Going to take those who have felt his love and take that away from them? I will not stand for it. Yes, my wife must become one of the sacrifices. I must do this tomorrow or I fear I will not have the strength. July 19th, 1936. Everything is ready. 
I have drawn the symbols in my own diseased sacred blood. My wife and niece, along with other random people pulled from the street, have been successfully tied down inside the symbols, and the bodies of those who have gone to be with Plague Father have been stacked inside of there as well. Tonight, at midnight, I will cut up the bodies of the glorious dead and feed them to my sacrifices. I can hear my wife crying, but why does it matter? She is a traitor, a heretic working against the love of the Great One. I'll feed her first. Together we will become the first apostles of Nergal and usher in a great age of delicious sickness and beautiful disease. Wait, I hear someone at the door. This is the last entry that can currently be deciphered. The rest appear to be covered in blood. Officials are attempting to uncover the rest, if any, in the house. What is known, though, is that at approximately 8.30pm on July 19th, a witness heard screaming coming from Dr. Perditus's residence. After the police were contacted, they made entry to find him attempting to feed the severed arm of a diseased patient from Marygrove Hospital to his restrained wife. Officers attempted to subdue him, but he pulled a knife. In fear of their own lives, the officers shot and killed him. The diary was then discovered in his study, along with the partially eaten body of another patient. It is unknown at this time what caused him to fall so far, but hopefully the more we uncover in this diary, the more it'll point us in the right direction. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>